Here at Harvey's, we're incredibly lucky because we deal in the great period of English craftsmanship, English antique furniture made between about 1660 and the end of the 19th century. It was a period of great change and I wanted to just take a few minutes to discuss some of the changes that took place in styles and tastes during the period that we're talking about. If we go back to the middle of the 17th century, that was the period of the Commonwealth, Cromwell and austerity. Furniture design was quite austere, very little in the way of decoration, and it wasn't until the restoration of the monarchy in about 1660, when Charles II came and took the throne of Britain, that we see the first real inclination towards English cabinet making and English furniture. And in fact, it's in this book by Adam Bowett, English Furniture, from Charles II to Queen Anne. He says the year 1660 has long been regarded as marking the beginning of modern English furniture making. How right he was. And in fact, the first chapter is called The Restoration, and it's all about the restoration of the monarchy and the different styles that came in with Charles II, because of course, he had lived most of his life until then on the continent. And when he came over, he brought with him a lot of foreign ideas, cabinet makers, and designers. And so we go through the late 17th century, and there are any number of different styles that come to the fore forefront, including one which was, I suppose we'd call it the Chinese taste, but in fact it was more Japan than Chinese. And this treatise of varnishing and Japanning by Stalker and Parker was published in 1688. And it has lots of illustrations of what I suppose people here in Britain had brought back from the continent thinking that these were typical of the designs for Japanning furniture, of how the people lived, of the animals there and so on. So that was an important influence and the style of oriental decorated furniture, japanned or varnished or lacquered, was very much in the forefront towards the end of the 17th century and the early 18th century. And then as we move through the reign of Queen Anne into the realm into the reign of George I, we see the change coming about towards the Palladian style. The Palladian architecture and the Palladian style was very much put forward by Lord Burlington. Lord Burlington worked with both William Kent and Colin Campbell and produced the most wonderful, wonderful designs in the Palladian manner. And we've got a book of designs here, designs of Mr Inigo Jones and Mr William Kent. And wherever you look in this book, you can see the Palladian feel. It's got something, it's very strongly architectural, but it's got something of the Italian feel to it, of the continental feel. You can see this going through and pervading through most of this period. So as we go through from the Palladian, we move into the middle years of the 18th century, which was an interesting period because you have, again, different styles. Whereas with all of these, we see the same themes occurring time and again. By the time we get to the middle of the 18th century, Thomas Chippendale, who was of course associated with that period, was working very much in the Chinese style, as he called it, which of course is merely a reflection of the earlier Japaning that we were talking about at the end of the 17th century. So once we get to Chippendale, we have his definitive style. He was certainly working in the Rococo, which was an adaptation of the French Rokai, and he was working as well in other modes, such as the Gothic, which again is a direct derivative of the 16th and 17th century Gothic styles. But then he progressed, along with others, such as Ince and Mayhew, who produced their universal system of household furniture. But again, in Chippendale's Gentleman and Cabinet Makers Director, we see standard pieces, but we also see the decoration, which is very much Rococo, influenced by the French designs, and Gothic. You know, there's a writing table here with a lot of Gothic tracery in it. 
But we also know that Chippendale himself was influenced later very much by the work of Robert Adam. Robert Adam and his brother James were the foremost neoclassical architects and designers of the late 18th century. And they influenced Chippendale, who produced some of the most wonderful work in the neoclassical style. And we've only got to look at these wonderful commodes, the commodes that he produced, one of which was probably for Melbourne House in London, with a quite astonishing array of neoclassical iconography. Robert Adam had studied over in Italy and he was influenced by all the architecture that was there, along with things like the Raphael Loggia within the Vatican, where of course you have this wonderful, wonderful view of all these columns and overdoors, all in the neoclassical style, painted by Raphael. And we're very lucky that we have a set of engravings that portray exactly that. Robert Adam, and this book is called The Genius of Robert Adam and His Interiors, he was a genius. He was probably the first architect to design carpets and ceilings to reflect the same patterns. His iconography was extensive, using all the different icons that he'd seen in the neoclassical works that he'd seen out in Italy and using pastel colours, inlays, marquetry, parquetry, you name it, he produced very much his own style, which became extremely popular and, as I've said, was worked on by Thomas Chippendale, who produced some pieces for his clients, but also by another very interesting company, Ince and Mayhew. Ince and Mayhew were very, very high-grade cabinet makers working in London during the last quarter of the 18th century. They produced any number of fabulous pieces in the neoclassical style. They produced a commode, the Countess of Derby. They produced all sorts of beautiful pieces with neoclassical inlay and marquetry. From the 18th century, we move into the Regency period with its flamboyance, and again, the Chinese taste that came back once more. And again, in the Regency period, and moving into the Victorian period, we have the Gothic. And then we move into the second half of the 19th century, when something quite amazing happened. There was a company in London called Wright and Mansfield, and Wright and Mansfield bought a number of pieces that were made a hundred years earlier by Ince and Mayhew for their own use and collection. They then used them as models for furniture that they produced. And Wright and Mansfield were probably the leading creators of the 19th century neoclassical furniture that is so, so sought after today. They worked and produced pieces that were almost better than the originals by Ince and Mayhew, who they, did, who they actually admired greatly. And when we talk of Wright and Mansfield, that's the reason why we're here today, to look at a wonderful pair of console tables. It's a few months since I bought this pair of tables. When I saw these, it was a case of, I have to have these. I took one look at them and they just completely bowled me over. The beauty, the quality, the integrity and the intensity of these tables is just something so rare, so fabulous, that I had to have them. Let's just start with a brief description of the tables. They're a pair of semi-elliptical console tables, executed in satin wood, with rosewood crossbanding, and the most wonderful neoclassical marquetry inlays on them. And in the research that we were doing, Philippa made a note of the different awards that Wright and Mansfield received for their beautiful furniture. Philippa? Well, in fact, David, they were at the International Exhibition in London in 1862, followed by the Paris Exhibition Universelle in 1867, where they won a gold medal, 
as well as the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in 1876. And as a result of the awards that they got, the Victoria and Albert Museum acquired a number of pieces by Wright and Mansfield to show members of the public how fabulous the quality of their work was and how it compared so brilliantly with the work that was done in the 18th century by the likes of Inson Mayhew. And as an example, we have here the book on Inson Mayhew that was recently published and written by Hugh Roberts and Charles Cator. And in this book, there are illustrations of pieces that were made by Inson Mayhew, including a very, very beautiful commode. They made a commode for the Countess of Derby. And that was in the 18th century. In the 19th century, Wright and Mansfield copied it exactly. And that was the strength of their work. The iconography that you see here is typical, absolutely typical, of the iconography that was introduced by Robert and James Adam, the Adam brothers, in the 18th century. And when we talk of the iconography, I know Philippa and I spent a lot of time looking at the different symbols that you had. Now, David, will you explain some of these symbols? What uh, are we seeing here? I'm happy to do so. What we've got is we've got here in the center, this large tazza or dish with a pair of griffins, mythological creatures, and you can see that they're joined to these, again, urns by chains of husks running right the way through. And again, over here from the urn, going to the griffin on the corner there, again in a tazza, and sprouting this anthemium at the top. We also have the inlays here on the frieze simulating flutes and on the legs we have these paterae or flower heads on each of the styles and the legs themselves with ribbons and trailing bell flowers coming all the way down the legs. The quality. I don't think I have ever seen more vibrant satin wood on a piece of furniture. Now, David, when you're saying that you're seeing these neoclassical motifs, which we've seen in Italy, we've seen on the Ottaviani's representations of the loggia made by Raphael, what made you understand that these were neoclassical revival and not neoclassical direct? There are, there are a couple of things. One is the size. They're just that little bit smaller than a pair of 18th century console tables would have been. And it's the weight. They just, they, they don't have the same weight as an 18th century console table. The design could be straight out of Adam's books of designs. They could have been made by Inson Mayhew, but they were made by Wright and Mansfield a hundred years later. Now, when you're looking at these and imagining them in a home, I see that they're a pair. Can they go together? No, they would have been made as a pair of console tables. And we know this, although technically you could put them back to back in the middle of a room, but there are no fixings on there for clamping them together. So they'd have stood in the middle of a room and would have fallen over. So, no, these were made to stand at the side of a room. Probably on the piers, between the windows, and they might very well have had a mirror over each one of them to reflect more light into the room, making it lighter, making it more enjoyable to sit in the room. And on each of these, you might have had quite an important candelabra. And the light, of course, from the candelabra, from the glowing candles, would have been reflected off the mirrors into the room again. This was part and parcel of the interior decoration that was so pioneered by Robert and James Adam. And of course, David has mentioned to me that these have an overhang in the back, which would have kept the tables out from the skirting yeah. at the side of the rooms. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I'd say it's about an inch overhang at the back so that it could go right up against the wall with the skirting board 
not being disturbed. The most beautiful pair of tables. They are quite extraordinary, an extraordinary find. And I just can't tell you how thrilling it is to have them, even if we only have them for a short period of time. But to be able to look at these every day, it's just thrilling. It's what being an antique dealer is all about. Living, albeit for a short period, with the most beautiful things you can find. That's why every day we will rush to go to work because something exceptional is going to happen. I do hope you've enjoyed watching this video. We've certainly had a lot of fun putting it all together. If you want to keep up to date with our most recent acquisitions, invitations to antiques fairs and news about the trade, then you can do so by signing up to our regular e-newsletter using the link below. Thank you.